I saw it as a, a young teenager um, in those days going, you know, you only, the video shop was kind of the, the, your library, you know, and I discovered 2001, I was into sci-fi, I didn't really know anything about Stanley Kubrick at the time, I was probably about 12 or 13, and, it, you know, it just blew my mind, and it sort of, it, it, it was a moment where you just felt like you could dream, you know, and see, just see something so... It's, it's amazing now because I, I understand the film so much more, but at the time it was very different looking at it through teenage eyes. And it was, I'd never seen anything like it. You know, it was a trip. It was, it sort of, it also complemented the sort of music and the way that I liked looking at music and also its soundtrack and the way that that marriage and, and all of those things, I can't really ex describe, it just completely blew my mind. Um, and then I got into Stanley Kubrick and I started discovering his other films and, uh, and a lot about him in, in as much as you could find out. Um, I kind of became obsessed in those days. You know, you'd find out there'd be, there were different cuts and you'd have to go and find the Japanese laser disc to find <laughs> certain things yeah. of 2001 and became very obsessed with the process and how it was made and his thinking. And then when I did my first album, Science Fiction, when I was 24. Um, I managed to get a number for, for his production office, and I, I very stupidly, well, you know, I tried to get him to do a video for an uncle <laughs> song, which he actually, his assistant replied and said, unfortunately, he's doing a film called Eyes Wide Shut, but was really, in, he said it was a great idea, and, you know, come back to him after he's finished the film. Unfortunately, right. that never happened. Um, and now, very, very um, luckily, I've, I've been fortunate to meet some of his family and meet Jan and, and his, uh, uh, Christiana, his widow. And I, 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 you know, he's just somebody that I, I it, you know, it's somebody that incredibly inspires me in every way. And, and this film in particular, I think, is, you know, it's a masterpiece. It was made before man had been to the moon. You know, the internet, mobile phones, all of these things in a film that it, it's quite extraordinary, sure. you know. And at the time when you discovered it, you, you said as a teenager, um, that was about the same time that your ideas around music were coalescing. And you was it sort of did it all happen at the same kind of period? You were thinking about yeah. So I mean, it works. was it was hip hop and and but hip hop, you know, f you know, was it was about samplers and it was about technology. And so a lot of my my my, my me and my friends' references were science fiction, um, and hip hop always kind of went together in a weird way. And electronic music, you know. Um, yeah. So, just thinking about, for me, the well, there's there's many many things about the film which set it apart from um, almost everything else in in the form of cinema. But the most striking thing is the way that Kubrick employs music in the film. So maybe we can bring Jan in here to talk about the process. The process. Certainly, which <coughs> this certainly. Happened. But uh, yeah, bef before we talk about music, which is uh, really a second stage. You have to ask yourself, why did he want to make this film? In the first place. I think, in the first place, I think this seems to be the most important part. And uh, he and, uh, and Arthur, and I, I remember I met them all very, very often. I lived in New York at that time, too. And um, they were racking uh, their brain how to be expressive. Neither of them were religious people. And both of them were full of admiration and awe for the universe, for the endlessness of time and space. How do we take a bow to the completely unknowable? And that's what the film is about. Yeah. And how do we say that evolution is the greatest complement to creation? Yeah. Totally outside any religion. Yeah. Because that's what it is. We, we don't really understand anything. We are ourselves each one of us a walking miracle. And we are surrounded by miracles. And we have a hundred billion suns, uh, like jewels sitting <laughs> at the sky at night, uh, provided we don't have too many clouds. And uh, so, and, and, and all this comes out of them. It is, and it is so interesting that when the film finally came out, it was people like you, age 12, who flipped. Yeah. The film was rescued by teenagers. Young men, 
up to 30, let's say, but particularly boys between 12 and 18 were totally mesmerized by this film because at a time when things were often talked down, you know, parents, teachers, police, government, it's all a lot of rubbish. And there comes Kubrick after Dr. Strangelove, you know, and takes this bow and says, oh no, oh no, it's wonderful. Think positive, it's great. And another thing that's important is <coughs> that he, in this very long process of, of developing a script for this, uh, took away all the explanations. Yeah, because I'm fascinated with that. It the, seems Absolutely. The first 20 minutes, you will see the film now, uh, uh, there is not a word spoken. Originally, he had narration. There came a guy who explained everything. Oh, he said, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> I mean, the audience, they're not idiots. I mean, you know, if, if they don't understand it, no explanation will help. Yeah. And if they understand it, and, and, <laughs> and if they understand it, you don't need to explain it. You know? and, and another Kubrick sentence, which I always loved. I mean, I worked with him for 30 years. And, and I met him practically every day. I mean, yeah, and, and, and he said so many things which are so profound. And one of them is never explain anything that you don't understand yourself. <laughs> yeah, which is so, so absolutely true. Yeah, and uh, it is so interesting that I started with him on Napoleon. Uh, and a film that unfortunately was never, never, never made. Now you could say, what does that have to do with it? Well, it all has to do with it because there is a thin red line going through all of Kubrick's films because it was only one person. It's like you recognize uh, Monet or Van Gogh or the music by Bach, or do you recognize it because it's one handwriting? And, and of course, Kubrick looked all the time at our own weakness at the folly of men. And the folly of men is his, that was his driving element. And um, yeah, and you also see this in this film. And when, um, <laughs> can I just pick up on something, because you said the film was rescued. Do you mean in a commercial sense? Oh, in a commercial sense, yeah. The film, when it opened first, it was a disaster in America. Uh, and uh, the uh, yes, the main critics, I mean, very, very brilliant people like Pauline Kael, who wrote for The New Yorker, thought it was the most boring film she had ever seen. You know, and there's nothing you can do about it as an artist. You know, you, you're helpless because you have to do something that convinces yourself. And I have observed this all the time. You know, a complete uh, focus, which is utterly subjective and completely f personal. I mean, I remember on, during Eyes Wide Shut, where we have a so-called orgy. I don't know who, who has, maybe some of you have filmed this. <coughs> it, for Stanley, it had nothing to do with an orgy. It was a, a, look, a look into a modern hell. It, it was a Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch-inspired modern hell. Okay, so that's fine. So both the first assistant director and myself, we suggested, well, not everybody is going to get this, but you're going to get in trouble with the censor. <laughs> oh, they are not that stupid. <laughs> yeah. Well, they were, <laughs> and 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 he didn't see that. And you know, I love that quality. Yeah. I think that, that, that's absolutely fantastic that somebody is so convinced of his vision that he pushes it through recklessly because he had to be satisfied with it and that was a long haul yeah and so could, could i just bring it back to the the music in the film okay um sorry yeah it's <laughs> quite went quite a long way off it was all great but um so there are i mean there are in the film a number of uh i guess what you'd call substantial large um sure. famous celebrated pieces of classical music by Richard Strauss, Johann Strauss, Ligeti, um, Cacciatorian. Cacciatorian. And, and what, what, so what can you tell us about the process through which Kubrick went? OK, uh, all right. OK, I can t I t t start with something where I had nothing to do with. Uh, <laughs> and this is the Blue Danube. He had another soundtrack, which was modern electronic, in quotes, space music. He was not in love with it. And I'm using this term very deliberately. To be in love with it is necessary. This totally su subjective connection to the elements you see in a film or to hear in a film. 
So he, he, he didn't like it. It wasn't the cutting room. The film was already, this section was already cut, I'm talking about. And then he put, he always liked waltzes, as you know, in every film he has a waltz. You know, in the Eyes Wide Shut, the last one, which was determined six months before we started shooting. Had to be a waltz in a minor key. Do da, 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 you remember? Yeah. yeah. Okay, anyway, he was absolutely fixed on that one. Now, in a case of 2001, and Ray Lovejoy told me this, he was the editor, he played the Blue Danube in the cutting room. And he looked at the totally not matching cut. And he said, well, I mean, this gorgeous music, I mean, fantastic. We should try this. Is it? And, and the editor and the assistant, they thought, yeah, I really lost his bottle now. You know, I mean, this is a Viennese waltz, space music. Come on, give me a break. Yeah. Well, you never know. Anyway, he started, his love affair deepened. He recut the whole film because obviously you have a piece of music, you don't cut the music, you don't fade it out, you play it through. And now you have to cut to the music. And that's what he did. Everything has turning, as much turning as possible to go with the one, two, three, one, two, three. There it is. In many ways, uh, it made it so timeless as well, yeah, it not absolutely. being contemporary Today, music. Today, space music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. The other thing is the Zasprak spoke Zarathustra. Yeah, this is, um, he loved already the title. Because I didn't know at the time why he liked the title so much. That was something I brought from Zurich on an LP. We needle dropped, you know, through various big, he wanted something big and huge that comes to an end. Because the better it is, the more, the absolutely impossible to fade out or to cut it. It has to be a rounded thing. And this fanfare to this long, as Strauss calls it, a tone poem, comes to an end. Yeah, and he absolutely loved it, and he loved the title, which I didn't understand at the time why he loved the title. I later on understand it. And so that became a very famous piece. When I made this documentary about Kubrick, I needed to go to Peter's edition to get the rights to use this, because it was not yet in public domain. And uh, I said, look, I mean, this is a, I, I, don't pay, I don't pay anybody. I really have to have a very tight budget on this. It's a documentary about Stanley Kubrick, and the, the boss of Peter said, look, because Kubrick used this. We made so much money <laughs> because we sold it to commercials and what have you. You can have it for one pound, <laughs> which you don't even have to pay. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, yeah. It's, it's, a, good, uh, it's yeah. a good business model. Yeah. Yeah, good. Make, a, make a timeless classic piece, masterpiece, and yeah. you get the rights for free. Um, I just want to pick up on something else. That James mentioned um, that the film was made in, well, released in 68, so it was being made in 66, 67. Um, and you mentioned it was about technology and, and, and the whole thing about hip hop is, is to do with using technology. Um, could maybe the two of you talk about the special effects and what, what they mean to you and, and what you know about the processes that were involved? When I, when I met Christiana recently, she was talking about how she works with Douglas in the house, in the, basically in a kitchen sink, pouring liquid into into the sink. It was the very first thing they did because uh, there and was that was for the Stargate sequence, the yeah. psychedelic yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah, first of all, they, the art department was doing many, many drawings on, on fantasy landscapes and they all ended up with Magritte-type paintings, you know, which, was, which was fairly obvious. Well, yeah, it didn't really satisfy Stanley to show what might be not just beyond Jupiter, but far beyond Jupiter, where we really have no idea. And uh, so he asked all, everybody to come up with something. And then one of the first things he wanted to do is to show what you later on see in the film, these kind of movements of, of gases or whatever, or whatever it might be. You see that in the film, in, in that sequence, where it's a split scan technique, uh, one thing. It is um, <coughs> second unit photography over the Grand Canyon and stuff like that, which was distorted chemically. But in between, you have these very strange uh, blobs flowing around. And that's one of the first thing he did. That was done in a kitchen, in a, a little, in a, in a little um, yeah, a basin. The problem was you needed an incredible amount of light to get an exposure at a very high speed camera because what it did is uh, uh, take droplets of let's say red nail polish, yeah, which you put on a little 
one of the things where you put drops in your eye, one of those things, whatever it's called. Pipettes. And Yes, that's right. And you drop one drop of that into water or try vinegar or try petrol or try and it's a liquid of a different viscosity. And you film that high speed. And then next day you see from when you get the stuff back from the from the lab, how does it look like? Most of it is useless, and some of this is fantastic. And that's what you see in the film. There's one element which just looks like a dolphin suddenly developing. You will see that. That's really done on, on a table, teachy little stuff. That was one of the first things he did. I think, uh, he, he, yeah, he was very inventive. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he often in the, um, in, in the development of, of cinematography, in this particular case, it is form, not substance, uh, he came up with new ideas. He was the first to put the Steadicamp with Garrett Brown yeah. properly uh, on, on, onto the map with the shining uh, or, and wheelchair dollies and all this kind of stuff. He was Because I, I saw at the, in the archive, I saw very interesting letters between him and the Hilton. Mm -hmm. And it was a very frustrated letter. Um, very, very, it, it reminds me of a kind of letter my father would write, because you don't really write letters like that anymore. But he was basically, everybody that was involved in the film, technologically wise, he would talk to the major companies, so the Hilton, he asked them to develop things for the film. Mm -hmm. And he just basically absolutely ripped them apart in this letter, just saying this is the worst futuristic stuff that I've ever seen somebody come up with. How can this be possible? And there was this great quote at the end. It, so, it says something like, very annoyingly and, and frustratingly, but lovingly yours, Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And all the stuff with IBM and how he worked with them to develop technology and to, not, sorry, I, I assume it's before IBM because actually Hal is how IBM took their name, isn't it? It's yeah. H I A, you know, B L M. Yeah. IBM, I think, I believe IBM developed the technologies and then there was. There was some legal reason, so he called it HAL, which is... Yeah, each, yeah he didn't use the word IBM, though. No. No. But it's the next letter or yeah, the letter yeah, before, yeah, isn't it? But IBM definitely developed the computer that sang the, the song Daisy. It was the first ever computer-synthesized mm -hmm. song, I believe, if you believe what you read yeah. on the internet, anyway. Um, the thing about HAL, for me, which is most interesting, is um, actually the dialogue that, that HAL mm -hmm. speaks in the film is the most emotionally charged and the most human, mm. if you like, which I, th I believe was a deliberate um, strategy that Kubrick employed. Yeah, well, what's also important is that Hal function functioned perfectly well. He was destroyed by the, by, by the people who give him the instructions, because he says at one point, uh, no computer of the age, blah, 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 has ever distorted information or given, at the same time, we know that, that yeah, yeah, he, he's lying. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, so that he couldn't. He couldn't he had deal some sort with of that. Paranoid, <laughs> paranoid. <laughs> he episode. couldn't deal with yeah. that. Yeah, he couldn't deal with that. And that's and expanded upon in uh, yeah. after C. Clarke's second, the follow-up, the yeah. the novel. In Absolutely. The yeah. Well, the novel was written after the film was made, yeah. and they certainly didn't want the novel to be written at all. But you know, Arthur was his friend, and Arthur lived on writing books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so, so okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. but um, that's that's what it is. Did Stanley ever think about ever making more science fiction? I know he developed AI all. with, with Spielberg. Yeah, well, that was futuristic. A AI, he loved the story of AI. That's a very black story. And it was originally a short story, wasn't it? It about, was a yeah. short story by Brian Aldiss called Summer Toys Last All Summer Long. Yeah. Stanley then t uh, yeah, worked on this story, put the Pinocchio element in it and all that. Uh, but it, it's really, that's just form. It's substance. It's, we are gone. Humanity has disappeared, and 2,000 years later, its robots are the robots which have been developed to an enormous degree. We don't know for how long, yeah? for 500 years maybe, for 200 years, we have no idea. Robots are the only remnants of a long gone human ingenuity. But we are gone. Well, yeah, the way we behave, this is a very a valid scenario.